Luke 1, 39 to 56. In those days, Mary set out and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judah, where she entered Zechariah's house and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leapt inside her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then she exclaimed with a loud cry, You are the most blessed of women, and your child will be blessed. How could this happen to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For you see, when the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby leapt for joy inside me. She who has believed is blessed because what was spoken to her by the Lord will be fulfilled. And Mary said, My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour, because he has looked with favour on the humble condition of his slave. Surely, from now on, all generations will call me blessed, because the Mighty One has done great things for me, and his name is holy. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. He's done a mighty deed with his arm. He scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He's toppled the mighty from their thrones and exalted the lowly. He satisfied the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. He has helped his servant Israel, mindful of his mercy, just as he spoke to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. And Mary stayed with her about three months. Then she returned to her home. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It struck me the other day as I was thinking about Christmas that there are very few times in the year when our community, our wider society, is so dominated by music. Uh, If you think about it, it's the only time of the year where in random parks around the country, people who never sing gather together to sing Christmas carols. There's no other holiday or period of time in our year where there is so much music and so much distinctive music. Not only do people gather in parks to do carols by candlelight, But if you go into shops and shopping centres, you'll remember the playlist from last year because they have it every year, don't they, this same music. And then when you turn on the radio, even on television, there's the Maya Bowl in Melbourne or the Domain. Carols, songs, music broadcast everywhere. As families gather together, someone will have the job of putting together the playlist, won't they? Uh, When I was growing up, you never had a playlist. You just had vinyls that you put on the record player. But there's a playlist that you'll put together and somewhere on the playlist, someone we'll put a carol. Even ABC Classic FM was asking this week for listeners to send in the perfect Christmas playlist. It's a reminder of how important music is, isn't it? How central music is not only to events but also to society, to our minds and our emotions. We've all been to events where the right playlist or song makes the event. We've also been to events where the wrong playlist and the wrong song can destroy the event, can't it? So one of the questions I think it's worth asking is, what makes the ideal song? What makes the ideal playlist? Now, this is no kind of uh, authoritative description, but as I was sitting at my desk looking at the ceiling, these are the ideas I came up with anyway. You'll see them on your outline under point one. An ideal playlist or song has got to deal with reality, something in the real world. An ideal song or playlist actually needs to lift our vision, not just from what we see in front of us, but to something bigger and greater. And an ideal song or playlist needs to create a response, doesn't it? A reaction to the words or the music that we've just heard. Christmas has always been like this. Many of the songs that we sing actually have ye and not you. That tells us they're a little older than us, doesn't it? They sometimes come from decades, even centuries ago, right the way back to the Bible. So when you flip open a book like Philippians chapter 2, 5 to 11, there's a hymn. I actually reckon it was probably one of the earliest Christmas carols. And then when you go back to the biographies, the birth stories of Jesus, there is music everywhere. Mary sings, and we're going to look at that in a moment. Then Zechariah sings. If you were here last night, you would have heard his song, a relative of Jesus, the father of John the Baptist. We know the angels sing. 
the shepherds go and look at this baby and then they come home worshipping God and usually that means singing. When Jesus is taken to the temple, Simeon sings. And then when the wise men turn up, probably two years later, what do they do? Yep, they sing too. Wherever you go in the birth stories of Jesus, there's music. There's song. I think it's helpful if we actually focus on the first song, the song that Mary sang, the song that she sang as she thought about the baby in her tummy and what it meant for the universe. So we're going to do that this morning very briefly. Let me pray and then we're going to dive into that together. Dear God, thank you for bringing us together this morning. Thanks for your word. Thank you for Mary. Thank you that she could sing. Thank you that we've got these words. Father, thank you that they deal with reality. Thank you that they lift our vision and our hearts. Thank you that they create a response. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, At point two on the outline, you only understand music well if you understand the context. Uh, When we used to go on holidays down the south coast, uh, I was in the days when we had the Valiant Station Wagon, Uh, Dad would always put in the same cassette. Kids, ask your parents what they are. And he'd put in the same cassette. It was by a band called Sky. Uh, instrumental music, everyone, yeah, you guys all know. And I still hum those songs when we go through those towns now because music is better in context, isn't it? You understand music in the context it's made. Uh, go to your hymn books. Read a hymn like, It is well with my soul. Then Google a story. And if you don't cry, I'll be amazed. Music is understood better in context. It's no different to Mary's song. Uh, We first meet Mary's song in Luke's biography of Jesus. Uh, If you were here last night, Neil reminded us that Luke was a Greek doctor. He's got a mate called Theophilus. Let's call him Theo for short because that's easier. And he wants to write a biography of Jesus for Theophilus. So Theophilus is reassured about what he believes about Jesus. So Luke's gone and, like any good doctor, carefully investigated all the accounts puts them together in an orderly sequence and writes them and says there in verses 1 to 4 of chapter 1, hey, Theophilus, read this so you're reassured about Jesus. Read this so you're reassured about Jesus. And he includes this song for that purpose. So just slot that away in the back of your minds. For Mary, when she sang this song, uh, it's been a whirlwind few months. Her close relative Elizabeth, probably upward of 50, maybe even 60, is pregnant. Uh, That'll make the news any day, won't it? Especially back then. Uh, She's now well into her pregnancy and there's a story about how it came about. Uh, Mary's got other things on her mind, hasn't she? She's got a wedding to plan. Uh, She's engaged to Joseph who comes from one of the leading families in the district, the family of David. Uh, That wedding's coming and a shock moment before the wedding, she's pregnant. And she understands it because an angel has visited her Joseph understands it because the same angels had a chat with him. The child that she bears isn't a mistake, it's planned. And he's actually going to be the saviour of the universe at God's initiative. Not only is it a whirlwind few months for her with all those things going on, but if you think about the time, it's a pretty barren time in the country. She lives in a country called Israel. She's a part of a people called Israel, known as the Jews. They have no independence. They're under the thumb of the Roman Empire. Their society is damaged with all these factions wanting power. Their independence is a long lost memory. The bloke who made them, God, well, when was the last time he talked to them? That was over 400 years ago. The promises that he made to them about who they'd be and how significant, the promises that he made to that bloke, Abram, that Ebony read about, well, they've just gone to the back of the pantry, haven't they? Where they've gathered dust, they've been forgotten, they're now doubted. It's a whirlwind few months for this young lady, isn't it? And she is thinking about what is going on. A wedding coming up, a baby to be born, a future that looks marvellous beyond all hope, promises that seem so dusty, that now seems so alive, and she sings this song in the midst of all that. As that angel came and talked to her, I'm at point three on the outline, as that angel came and talked to her, she questions and she said in verse 34 of Luke 1, listen, how's this going to be possible? It's the kind of typical sentence you expect from a Greek doctor. 
And the angel actually replies to her and gives her some evidence. Consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she has conceived a son in her old age, and this is a six months for her who was called childless, for nothing will be impossible with God. Elizabeth is Mary's cousin. She's old, let's be blunt. She's barren. That's how she's been known. And now she's bearing a child. Nothing is impossible with God. And so Mary, like any inquisitive and thoughtful young lady, decides to take up the angel's hint. There in verse 39 in that passage that we read, she sets out, hurries to a town in the hill country of Judah. She enters Zechariah's house and she greets Elizabeth. And when she turns up, Gee, that baby's active, isn't it? Because the baby inside Elizabeth leaps and Elizabeth speaks. Notice she doesn't say, gee, this baby's active. What does she say? Isn't it amazing that you, Mary, are approved by God and that you're the mother of my Lord? Now, you could describe it as an active baby, couldn't you? You could describe Elizabeth as a woman who's enjoying a pregnancy she'd never expected. But how does Luke describe it? Remember, he's a Greek doctor. These things aren't unusual for him. But look how he describes it in verse 41. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. You could have all sorts of explanations, but for Luke, this is the best one. God's fingerprints are everywhere. This is by God. It's the only sensible, rational, cohesive explanation of what's going on against the backdrop of history. And how does Mary respond? Well, she gives a song, doesn't she? Verses 46 through to 55. It's not like a song we know. It doesn't have verse and chorus, does it? It's almost like a stream of consciousness. She's so overwhelmed by these events that words just flow out of her mouth and jumble and roll. But if you look closely, there is a structure. There's some sense there. Verses 46 to 49, Mary's saying, hey, look at how big God is. Let me tell you how magnificent he is. You know how kids are like that at Christmas when they compare presents? Look how big my present is. Look how small your present is. Well, Mary goes with the first bit. Look how big my God is. Look at what my God has done. There is no one like him. Only God could do this. Now, verses 50 to 53, she then goes from what's happened in her life to what happens in all the world and all of history. And again, she says the same thing. Look at God. He is so merciful. He is so mighty beyond anything we could have imagined in this dust bowl. And then verses 54 to 56 She finishes by pointing out, guess who? God again. God has done exactly as he promised. It's not not a stream of consciousness, is it? It's actually a lesson about history that starts with Mary and finishes with God and has that God at the centre of all. And really, it's actually the perfect song, isn't it? When you think about that criteria I mentioned earlier. Now, let's just look at that very quickly. You'll see it there on your outline. Uh, Mary sings about the real world, doesn't she? Her feet are firmly rooted in the dust, in the dirt. She has a very healthy sense of who she is. She's someone who has kept God's command. She's a virgin. She describes herself as the slave or servant of God. She knows that as someone who's probably uh, between 12 and 15, that she's a woman of humble condition. Remember her condition too. Can you imagine the rumours? Can you imagine what she'd heard had been said, a pregnant, unmarried fiancé of one of the descendants of the greatest king of history? A young woman who is now gossiped about? She knows who she is. She's a real person in a real world. And she knows who she is before God, physically and spiritually. Uh, Physically, she's on the bottom of the social pecking order, isn't she? Within Rome and within this tin pot province out in the Middle East. A 14-year-old unmarried pregnant woman. She knows where she stands physically in this world. She also knows where she stands spiritually. 
Do you notice she describes herself in verse 48 as someone with a humble condition? Uh, That's code for I'm a sinner. I'm someone who thinks I'm God and God is not. I'm someone who's rebelled against God. I know that I am someone who is not right with God, left to my own devices. She recognises that about herself. And do you notice that that means she describes God in verse 47 as my saviour? She's completely dependent upon God. This is a real girl in the real world, isn't it? I think that's really helpful for us to listen to. I think that's very helpful for us to listen to. In the midst of a history that so many people regard as a fairy tale, kind of like an Indiana Jones on steroids. In the midst of a history that so many people regard as fictional, here is a real girl in a real world dealing with real events. That tells us something about God, doesn't it? God deals with reality. God deals in the real world. God doesn't deal with perfect people. God doesn't deal with people if they fit the right profile or hit the right performance standards. God doesn't work in the ideal circumstances as we might define them. God works in the real world with people who are broken, who are damaged, who are marginalised and who are humble. But Mary doesn't want us to just dwell on that, does she? She doesn't want us just to go, oh, poor Mary. She actually wants us to go, oh, magnificent God, doesn't she? Uh, That's why she wants to lift our vision from her to the God who's done exactly as he promised. And when you remember those circumstances I portrayed earlier where God's been silent for over 400 years, where the promises seem so dusty, you can realise how magnificent God is being active in this world. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit has rejoiced in God my Saviour. Mary doesn't dwell on her, does she? She leaps from her and says, look at God. Elizabeth, look at God. Theophilus, look at God. Narrabri, look at God. What's God done? And such a God has worked in this world. I look there in verse 50. His mercy is from generation to generation on those who fear him. Look at what God has done when people deserve something else. Look at what God has done when people deserve his judgment. Look at what God has done in a world full of seven billion rebels. Look at what God has done when we have turned our back on him. And Mary has known that personally and now she wants to draw the attention of the world to it. Not only is God merciful, but you see he's mighty, verse 51. He's done a mighty deed with his arm. He's scattered the proud because of the thoughts of their hearts. He's toppled the mighty from their thrones, exalted the lowly. He's satisfied the hungry with good things, sent the rich away empty. Mary's experienced that personally. Remember where she is? A humble young woman. A sinner being raised to the heights of bearing the Son of God. It's always been God's way. As Eb read that reading, Abram, what what was he doing when God talked to him? He was worshipping something other than God, wasn't he? And when David was called to be the king of all of God's people, the great, what was he doing? He was kicking sheep around. That's the way God's always worked. Giving people what they don't deserve because he is mighty. His concern is dealing with the broken state of the world. Which brings us to verse 54. He's helped his servant Israel, mindful of his mercy, just as he spoke to our ancestors, to Abraham and his descendants forever. They're the key verses. They're the key verses. Because they actually show us that God isn't just being nice. God's not just being generous. God's not just showing what magic he can do. No, God is actually doing as he promised. God is doing as he promised 
in dealing with a broken world. Well, the world's broken because it's full of humble people. Remember what that was code for? It's full of sinners. It's full of people who say they can do a better job than God. And that's brought a broken world, a damaged world, a world separated from God. A God's right to judge that world. Mary knows that, doesn't she? That's why God's her saviour. A God's right to hand humans over to the consequences of what they want. If you want life without me, go and give it a go. But that's not what God does, is it, at this point? What's so stunning is that God commits to a broken world. He commits to a world run by rivals and rebels. He commits in that promise to Abram that Ebony read to us to roll back the brokenness and restore what he intended. To deal with death eternally, to deal with the cause of death eternally, to do it through a particular family for all families. That's the story of the Bible, isn't it? The ups and downs, the twists and the turns. God does exactly as he promises, exactly as he promises, exactly as he promises. As, as Mary experiences all that, all the pennies are dropping. This is what God promised, that there would be someone who would come into the world to deal with our problem of sin. Now, the Bible's got a word for that, doesn't it? It's called grace. It's called grace. God giving to humans what they don't deserve. At the very moment, they deserve his judgment. What did Mary deserve? None of this. What did Elizabeth deserve? None of this. What did the world deserve? Certainly not this baby. And yet God made a promise and God does exactly as he promises. And so Mary sings and lifts our vision up. I don't think there's any mistake that in three or four months' time we're celebrating the end of Christmas. We'll gather again and we'll remember that this little baby was crucified as a grown man having lived a perfect life for people like us who rose from the dead to show publicly that he did as God promised, to show publicly that he'd beaten death, to show publicly that he had no rival, to show publicly that if we want to deal with the broken world, we've got to deal with him. And so finally Mary sings to trigger a reaction. In her very real world, Mary's vision has been lifted. She's seen God's grace. She's experienced God's grace. And she responds, look how big God is. Look at what God does. Look at how gracious God is. And so she wants to create a response. Elizabeth, Theophilus, Luke, Narrabri. Look how big God is. Look at what God has done. It really is the perfect song, isn't it? And when you look at all the songs there, it's the perfect playlist. Here is God dealing in reality, God working in real time and space, God's grace working for people who've turned against him. And so a song like this raises three questions for me, and let me finish by posing those questions. First, have you listened to the perfect song? Second, if you listen to that perfect song, are you reassured that God deals with reality? Third, are you reassured that God's commitment to this broken world is all about grace, giving us what we don't deserve? Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for Mary's song. Thank you that you deal with reality, that our vision is lifted. Father, please work a response in us, a response to your grace that knows how magnificent you truly are. Amen.